This evening, we're going to pick up right where we left off last Wednesday evening, talking about the defeat of Satan and what that means for us in our lives. And as we begin this evening, it's important to keep in mind and to be aware of the fact that the enemy is Satan. The enemy is not people. And I know that's not perfect English, but I went to school long enough, I can get away with it. I, I got an excuse. Amen. Amen. The, the enemy is not people. The enemy is Satan. The problem is Satan, not people. Whatever's going on, whatever problem there is, whatever need there is, whatever challenge there is, whatever difficulty there is, the problem is Satan, not people. And we have been learning how we are to fight the fight of faith against our adversary, the enemy, Satan, but we are not fighting people. Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 12, I'm going to read it out of the New King James. Ephesians 6, 12 says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. You know, it's amazing how people spend so much time and waste so much time fighting people and in drama with people. And it may seem like, it may look like the problem is this person or that person, but behind every problem, there's a spiritual root. Amen. And just as angels influence people for good, demons influence people for evil. And so the, the solution to every problem is spiritual. And so people waste time, drama, fighting people. You read First and Second Corinthians, that church had many issues. One of them was believers were suing other believers. And you've heard pastors say over the last two years to even head down those roads is contrary to faith. Because when you head down that road, you're saying, well, I don't believe God's my source. I don't believe, even if I've been wronged or stolen from, I don't believe God can make it up to me. So I'm going to try and squeeze blood out of a turnip. And nine times out of 10, that doesn't work. Nine times out of head, you're, you're behind, you're not ahead. You know, this Sunday, I'll, as an illustration, I'm going to talk about how God has blessed Jessica and I and where we live, but in that process, there were challenges. In that process, some people did not do us right, and so because of that, it was a real discipline to keep our confession right and our praying right. It was a real, dis I'm, I'm a, a geeky guy. I mean, I, I would love to get online and post a photo, never hire this person. And here's a photo proving why you never should. But again, God is our source. God is our supply. And if someone didn't do us right, God's going to make it up to us, and he's going to make it up to us sevenfold. Now, if I start fighting the battle myself, taking vengeance myself, trying to squeeze blood out of a turnip, or whatever it is I'm doing in the flesh, I negate that sevenfold harvest, which is foolish to do. The problem is not people. The problem is the enemy. We wrestle not, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now the good news is the enemy has been defeated, past tense. So the enemy is Satan, but the good news is he has been defeated. You know, I love T.L. Osborne, and he would tell some interesting stories, and he told a story once of how he irritated some preachers and pastors because he was somewhere at a conference and everyone was telling their biggest, scariest demon stories and the devil doing this and the devil doing that, and it got to be his turn, and they said, well, what about you? And he said, well, you know, this doesn't happen in my ministry because when I get to a town, the demons leave. <laughs> well, that, that didn't go over so well. But see, there was someone who walked in light of the finished work of Christ. And towards the end of his life, he even shared at a pastor's conference uh, a little blurb on prayer called The Winning Secret. You know, even people praying, you know, trying to tear down principalities and powers and all of this wasted effort instead of just walking in the light of what Christ has already done. He has won the victory 
Our job is to enforce the victory that has already been won. And we do that by faith, by our confession of faith, and by our declaration of what Christ has done. He came that we might have life more abundantly in every area of life. I like what F.F. Bosworth says, F.F. Bosworth, that Jesus went to the cross, spirit, soul, and body, to redeem us, spirit, soul, and body. The entirety of your life, every area of your life, yes, so that you will be saved. You're the real you, the spirit you will be saved, that you will dwell with God forever, but that, that's just part of it. That's not all of it. He went to the cross, spirit, soul, and body, so that the total you could be redeemed. Spirit, soul, and and body, so that you could be well in your body and have an abundant life in your body, so that you could be well in your home and in your family and your marriage and in your finances. Oral Roberts would say it this way, Jesus went to the cross to redeem the total man, the total woman, and he came to show us how to take authority over every problem, every need, every situation. Satan has been defeated, and he has no right, he has no place, he has no authority in your life unless you give him a place. Jessica and I don't go to the movies much anymore. We went recently, I regretted it. I felt like I was gonna get in a fight just over the butter machine for the popcorn, (laughs) trying to walk by the spirit, amen, not by the flesh. You know, but this time of year, they shouldn't be showing previews for scary movies. You know, that's September, October. And they were showing these previews, all these scary movies. None of that's going on in my life. None of that's going on at my house. If Satan has a place, it's because someone's given him a place. You've heard me tell the story. I mean, this would be 20, 30 years ago. Family told pastor, man, we don't know what's wrong with our son. We don't know why he has such a bad attitude. Well, that was back when my father would go over to someone's house and, you know, they wanted him to pray over his room. Well, when they opened the door to his room, he understood what the problem was. You know, Kiss posters, Metallica posters. I remember being a a young guy at a Christian concert, and there were some older kids there, but one kid had a Metallica shirt on that had a demon on it, and it said, I'm the devil inside of you. Well, again, you know, like Wilkerson said, there's a spirit behind what you listen to and buy, right? So if we're watching the wrong things, listening to the wrong, you know, yeah, you're going to have some problems. Went to make a hospital visit yesterday to see a new baby, there was a young man, you know, 20 years old, parking in handicap parking. Nothing, it didn't look like anything was wrong with him, but he was blasting his music. But, I mean, the language, beep this, beep that. I mean, you fill your heart and mind with that, it's going to come back out. It's going to come back out. And so we have to watch what we're doing, watch what we're watching, watch what we're imbibing, watch what we're listening to, Amen. And so he has no place in our lives unless we give him a place. So in your life, what are you permitting or allowing? Or the flip side, in your life, what are you forbidding? Matthew 18, verse 18, Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind or forbid, whatever you bind or forbid on earth will be bound or forbidden in heaven, and whatever you loose or permit on earth will be loosed or permitted in heaven. And so, as I said last Wednesday night, you have the authority in your life, in your home, in your family, and God will back you up. The Holy Spirit will back you up. And just by speaking a word of command, you can drive the enemy out. Whether it's in terms of a physical challenge, a financial challenge, uh, an attitude challenge with a child or teenager, amen? And so you just got to have the attitude, we ain't doing that here. It's Texas, it's all right to say it. We're not doing that here. We're not watching that here. We're not talking that way here. We're not behaving that way here. You know, and this whole culture has lost its mind. I mean, when I was a college student, it it didn't make sense to me. I mean, I was for it that my parents had no right to know what my grades were. I mean, I was for that, but that's (laughs) stupid when you think about it. Whoever is paying the bill should have the right to know what the grades are. You know, well, it's their room. You're, you're paying the mortgage. It's, it's their iPhone. You're paying for it. You're paying like $150 a month for it or whatever you're... 
We, we, we need to wake up from this mirage of this nonsense in our culture. And so don't give the enemy any place. And if he's shown up, drive him out. Go to war. Go to battle. Do what it takes. Drive him out. You don't have to put up with any work of the enemy. And what is the work of the enemy? John 10.10. 10. The enemy comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. So if there's any stealing, that's the enemy. If there's any killing, that's the enemy. If there's any destroying, that's the enemy. You have the authority to forbid anything that you don't want in your life. And God, he'll back you up. Negative report, don't accept it. Bad news at work, don't accept it. And remember, God is your source. So even if they do lay off, shut down, close down, he's your source, he's got something better for you. He's your source. He's your supply. He's your provider. And we're going to get to, in fighting this fight of faith, the main way we do it is with our mouth, with our confession, with our words. And so what you say is everything. Satan has been defeated. Jesus paid the price, and we get to enjoy the benefits. That's the wonder of the new covenant. He paid the price. He did what you and I could never do. He, he paid the price you and I could never pay. And the wonder of it is not only do we enjoy salvation, but we also enjoy all the benefits. You might say, well, we didn't earn it. Right, we enjoy all the benefits. We don't deserve it. Right, but we enjoy all the benefits. It is, it is a wonder of heaven. He did all that he did for us. We enjoy the benefits. His victory is our victory, and he triumphed over Satan. Colossians 2 and verse 15 says, and having disarmed the powers and authorities. And notice that word disarmed. You know, if a burglar is disarmed, that burglar has been rendered ineffective. He has been disarmed. Remember, he prowls around like a roaring lion. He, you know, again, 2019, people are confused. That includes the enemy. You know, and Jessica... We had the last baby, Julia. I mean, they actually asked her in, in Mansfield. I mean, I understand if they're dumb enough in New York City to ask these questions. But they actually asked her at Mansfield, in, at Mansfield Methodist, if she identifies as a woman or as a man. I mean, that tells you how nuts this culture is. I mean, we're not living in L.A., New York, Vermont. <laughs> Just assuming they're liberal. I'm here to have a baby, of course. Duh. <laughs> People are confused. And Satan prowls around like a roaring lion, but he's not a roaring lion. He's playing dress up. <laughs> and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross. He's defeated. Jesus put to naught every work of Satan on Calvary's cross. He conquered the prince of darkness. Some synonyms for that word not mean of no use or value, to cancel out as if it never existed. See, Jesus restored all that Adam lost and more, but we haven't realized it. We haven't walked in it. To, to be not means to be of no use or value, to cancel out, to neutralize, to negate, to render ineffective. So he has no right place or authority in your life unless you give him a place or think he has a place. Hebrews 2.14 in Rotherham's translation says, he paralyzed, Christ paralyzed the death-dealing power of Satan. So this was an eternal victory. And so our job, we're not, we're not fighting people. The enemy is not people. The enemy is Satan. And we need to be mindful of that. Whatever's going on, whatever problem, there, there's demonic influence. But we don't have to be afraid of that. We don't have to lock the door and, and cry and be afraid. We don't have to go to a spiritual warfare conference. We simply have to walk in the authority that Jesus Christ gave us, which we do with our mouth. By saying what the Word of God says. That's it. That's it. it it's, 
And again, that's why I'm so thankful as a young man I got to be around somebody like T.L. Osborne because he walked in this. And it was simple. And it was faith. And it was simply walking in the finished work of Christ. No, no emotionalism. Just knowing who you are in Christ and letting the word of God come forth out of your mouth. It has great power. 1 Peter 5.8, be self-controlled and alert. You know, we... In this culture we live in, Jesus said, in regards to evil, be innocent. We know there's evil going on. We don't know. We don't need to know all that is going on. In regard to evil, be innocent. At the same time, we do need to be aware of the enemy's devices. We need to be self-controlled. We need to be alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And again, you watch the Discovery Channel. You watch National Geographic. You know, lions are lazy. And when you go on safari, it's always the female lions doing all the work. But when, when they, you watch those specials or documentaries or you go in person, when they, they pick off an animal, they, they pick off an animal at the fringes. They pick off a straggler. They pick off a, a baby that can't keep up. They, they, they pick off an animal that's injured. Or they pick off the dumb animal that's away from the herd doing its own thing. And there's safety in numbers. That's why when Jesus sent them out, he sent them out how? Two by two. And so he prowls around like, he's not a roaring lion, like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And he has no right to devour in our lives unless we give him a place. He's a deceiver. And he deceives too many Christians into thinking he has power in their lives when he has already been defeated. He has been eternally defeated. So we're not fighting people. I, I use Jessica and I as an illustration. When we went through the process of our new home and, and faced a few things, and what's terrible is when you face that stuff with people who say they're believers. You know, if people really believe there's a God, they wouldn't do half what they do. And if people really believe there's heaven and hell, they wouldn't do half what they do. But again, we have to remind ourselves, no matter what we face in our job, and our work, we have to remind ourselves that God is our source. You know, there's a man in the church in cells in Dallas, and he, he faces a lot of opposition on the job because he's basically the only believer. Sunday, I read the testimony of a man in the church, and he, he's represented by a company in terms of the deals they get for his company. And that company had another company they, they are in business with. They were trying to steer the contract to that business. But this man in the church, he, he not only said what he wanted, but he told it to everybody who worked for him. And despite all of this plotting, scheming, conspiring, his company still got the job. It was a $500,000 job. Praise God. Amen. So we can apply these principles of saying what the word says and fighting the fight of faith to every area of life, to any physical challenges, to any financial challenges, to any relationship challenges, to any parenting challenges. And part of it's just to having the backbone of steel in the word of God that you're just not gonna put up with certain stuff. You're not gonna put up with sickness. You're not going to put up with disease. You're not going to put up with need or lack or want. And you're not going to put up with anyone in your home acting or behaving or doing anything that's not godly. Amen. Amen. That's good. But somebody's got to decide. See, we, we do our part here. Sunday, Wednesday, Sunday school class, the Word of God's being sown. But then individuals have to take the Word of God with them and make up their minds in their own lives what they're going to have. And you've heard pastors say, God will do whatever you're willing to believe him for. He'll do whatever you say he'll do on the basis of his word. And he'll back you up, as I've been saying. And so if you decide you're not going to allow the enemy to have any more of a place in your life, God will back you up. But you've got to decide. You've got to enforce the victory in your home, in your family, in your sphere of influence. So we're not fighting people. Our job is to enforce the victory Jesus has already won. We do that by fighting the fight of faith. We do that by our confession, by our declaration of faith, by our saying 
the same thing God says, which the word is homologeo, to say the same thing God says. So the only fight that we as Christians are to fight is the faith fight. That's it. That's what we're to be busy doing every day, fighting the good fight of faith. When we wake up in the morning, we spend time in prayer, doing our confessions, what are we doing? We're fighting the fight of faith. When you're out and about and there's this negative thing said or that negative thing said or at work, there's this negative report or that negative report, when in response, you say what God says, you say what the word of God says, you're fighting the fight of faith. When maybe you're doing a checkup and there's a negative report, and you don't accept it, but you say what the Word of God says, or your spouse says what the Word of God says, you're fighting the fight of faith. When you find out about a, a bill maybe you didn't know about, or a need you didn't know about, and you say, God is your source, and God is your supply, and He is your provider, and the money is coming in. Don't know how, but you know the money is coming in. You're fighting the fight of faith. Amen. This is what we are to be doing, fighting the good fight of faith. And Satan, he, again, he's a deceiver. He's all about getting us to do things that are counterproductive and are ineffective, that don't generate any results or victory. He's about getting us to do things, everything but fighting the fight of faith. And that's why if he can get us off on weird tangents, he will. Which sometimes we can do that out of desperation. We've all been there. But again, we enforce and we win the victory with our mouth with our words. 1 Timothy 6.12, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you are called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Fight the good fight of faith. So as Christians under the new covenant, this is the only fight we are to fight. And Paul calls it good. Why? Because a good fight is a fight we win. We have one because of what Jesus did on our behalf but what we have to do is enforce that victory in our lives because he's a liar. Satan's a liar. Satan is a deceiver. And what he does is he tries to talk people out of what belongs to them. Jesus paid the price so that we could be well in our bodies, but Satan is a deceiver. He, he talks believers that Jesus paid the price so they could be well in their bodies, but through religion, through doubt-filled preaching, he convinces people that sickness is the will of God. It's a lie. It's a deception. Jesus paid the price so that every knee could be met and we could walk in the blessing of God. But yet he has many believers. Satan has many believers convinced that lack is the will of God, that, that having nothing is pious. Having nothing is spiritual. Having nothing is godly. He's a liar. He is a... He is a deceiver. He'll get believers convinced that some work of his, stealing, killing, or destroying, it's the will of God. It's not the will of God. Amen. And you can be free of it. And you can have the victory. And how do you gain the victory? You gain it by fighting the fight of faith. And we do that with our words, with our declaration of what God has said. Win every victory in your life by faith with your confession. Win every victory in your life by faith with your confession. Now, action is tied together with that. Sundays, we've been learning that the, the four steps to receiving miracles is to say it, then do it, receive it, and tell it. So, got to have action. But the first, what's step number one? Got to say it. Got to speak. Got to declare. Our words have more power than we realize. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And it's not coincidental, death comes first, because most people are speaking death. And we, we live here inside of a faith bubble. We come to church inside of a faith bubble. We don't like say, man, we need like five or six negative speakers every year just to counterbalance. <laughs> so we're, we're here in our faith bubble. <laughs> you get out there in the world, even out there among other believers, and it, it is amazing how much negativity is said and is spoken. Win every victory in your life by faith with your confession. Win every victory with your words. Learn what the Bible says. Say what God says. And with your words, you will defeat the enemy. With your words, you will defeat the enemy. 
Learn what the Bible says. Then say what God says. And with your words, you will defeat the enemy. You will drive him out. Why? It is God's word that has power. Walt Whitman has no power. Jane Austen had to read all those, get my degree, has no power. Word of God has power. Amen. Amen. Talk radio has no power. <laughs> you know, nobody, and, I'll, and I'm all for these conservative guys. I'm not being critical. Although it, it can make you feel like you got to buy a bunch of beans and go into hiding. <laughs> but nobody ever once has been listening to Rush Limbaugh and had a, a miraculous healing in their car. No, nobody's ever been watching some, you know, show at evening on secular TV and been healed. Nobody ever once has been in a Cowboys game and they threw a pass that got caught, not intercepted. And then they're like, glory to God, and then boom, got healed. And listen, there, there's nothing wrong with things that are neutral. But my point is, it is the word of God that has power. It is his word that has power. And so you've got to get his word in your heart, but not just in your heart. You've got to get his word coming out of your mouth because that's how you fight the fight of faith. That's how you win the battle. That's how you enforce the victory that Jesus has already won. It's by speaking. It's by declaring. No, we're not doing that. No, we're not having that here. No, we're not doing that in our home. No, you don't have any place. No, you don't have any authority. No, we're, we're the blessed and the healed and the made rich of Almighty God. Amen. Now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Sickness has got to go. Lack has got to go. Bad attitudes have got to go. Amen. 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 We're, you know, we got little ones. Spanking a day keeps trouble away. Amen. Amen. I'm, I'm exaggerating. Don't. <laughs> Say what God says. At the gate called Beautiful, Peter spoke to the sick man. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. Peter didn't lay hands on him. Peter didn't pray. He, he spoke. He said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. That man was healed with words. Jesus healed many times with words. That's how our Heavenly Father created the universe. He spoke, and then it was. Let, he said, let there be light, and there was light. He spoke. Words have great power. And we're made in His image. See, we've not realized the power and the authority that we have. And all that Adam lost and more has been restored. You will win and overcome every time with your words. You can heal the sick with your words. Words have creative power. The negative side is words have destructive power. Yes, we can pray. We can lay hands on the sick. But we can also say, we can speak. We can heal with our words. A few Sunday mornings ago, and we do things as led by the Holy Spirit. Well, why did they do this this day? But then another day they did something else. We do our best, and we're, we're human beings. We're not perfect, but we do our best to be led by the Holy Spirit. So two Sunday mornings ago, during, the, I think, the beginning, or at some point during the message, I instructed people just to take their right hand to put wherever there was trouble in their body, and we just spoke and declared. Using what? Words. Using, using words. And we have a testimony from that I'm going to share this Sunday of a lady being healed. Amen. Our words have greater power than we realize. Amen. Prayer or the laying on of hands may be necessary among baby Christians or new believers, but for believers who are mature, who have grown up, it is the word of God that heals us. It is the word, the spoken word that heals us. It is the word, the spoken word that meets every need. What will enable you to overcome? What will enable you to win and prevail? What will enable you to change your life and to change your circumstances? It is the word of God. And as we've learned on Sunday mornings, what must you do with the word? What is step number one? Got to say it. Not think it. Got to say it. And 
not just in front of your husband or wife. I mean, if this is new to you, I mean, you may have to work up to saying it in front of your husband or wife, but the more you say it and the more you say it around everyone without being ashamed or bashful about it, the greater power you'll have and the greater results you see, especially around lost people. Amen. Now, we can, we're to be as wise as serpents, as harmless as doves, amen. But we ought to be looking for opportunities to tell people about God, about the goodness of God, about the blessing of God, about the power of God. And as you do that, and step number four, tell it, man, this will take on great, great power in your life. I mentioned Sunday how we had a wonderful Christian man doing some work for us. They're believers wonderful people, but they, they don't know about faith. They don't know about prosperity. They don't know about confession. And he was telling me about some things that they had recently faced that day, in fact. And it just I mean, came right out of my mouth. I said, well, that just means something great and wonderful is going to happen in your life and in your business this week. I mean, he looked at me like I had said the Cowboys were gonna win the Super Bowl next year. <laughs> But that's step number four, telling it. See, we, we have greater power than we realize. We have greater authority than we realize. And our words have creative, positive power. Now, the negative side is they have destructive power, and people use their words for terrible things. And basically what they do, it's like the example in Proverbs, they tear down their own lives with their words, with their, with their mouth. But the positive side is our words have great, great power. So we say it, we speak, and that's how we win the victory. That's how we enforce the victory that Christ has already won. That's how we drive sickness out of our lives. That's how we drive lack out of our lives. That's how we drive not enough out of our lives, by our confession of faith. And that's why those prayer tools that pastor has put together are so helpful. The book of prayer, but then the confession booklet because that keeps us on track with our confession. Amen. Amen. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. In the Greek, Paul literally wrote, Faith comes by hearing the anointed spoken word, the rhema Christos, the anointed spoken word. Now we can understand Psalm 107 and verse 20, He sent His word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Healing is the children's bread. So you need more healing in your life? Feed upon the Word of God. Speak the Word of God. Need more victory in your life? Feed upon the Word of God. Speak the Word of God. Need more success and prosperity and blessing in your life? Feed upon the Word of God. Speak the Word of God. This is where the victory is. And Jessica will tell you, we just, I'm committed to this. I'm very careful. I'm not listening to talk radio. She'll tell you in my car during the day. Now, when I pick up the kids, they want to listen to music. But that is the only time I'm playing music in my car. But praise God, they like Christian music and they like old-fashioned gospel music. I think it's hilarious. <laughs> so it's old-fashioned gospel. But the rest of the time, I'm listening to sermons. I'm listening to Pastor. I'm listening to Fred Price. I'm listening to Kenneth Hagin. I'm listening to some other. I'm listening to Faith filled sermons. I, I can't walk in too much victory. You can't walk in too much victory. Amen. You can't walk in too much word. And whatever we're praying about, believing God about, the solution is more word. More word, more victory. And when you're listening to the word and reading the word and meditating on the word, you're storing it up in here. So what's going to come out? The word of God. And what has power? His word. What has authority? His word. It is his word that heals us. It is his word that meets every need. His word meets every need. And it brings money into our hands as we speak it. Philippians 4.19, Paul writes, My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Say this, say, God is my source. God is my, source. God is my supply. God is my source. Say, the money is coming in. Money is coming in. Say, every need is met. Every bill, is paid. Every bill is paid. And there is always, there is always, always, always plenty, left over. plenty left over. Say, God is blessing me. Is blessing 
and my family and this church with more than enough. Say, I expect miracles today. And I believe I receive miracles today. I expect money to come into my hands above and beyond today. And I believe I receive money is coming into my hands above and beyond today. God is my source. I've got seed faith in the ground. And so I have a seed faith, miracle harvest coming my way today and every day until my last day. Now that is a proper use of the mouth. That is a proper use of the mouth. Amen. To say not, not what you fear, not what you dread, not what you're worried about, but what you want. And what is true on the basis of the Word of God. Amen. And He'll back you up. Money is non-fatal. So practice your faith with money. Exercise your faith with money. Grow your faith with money. And I'm, as we conclude this evening, I'm going to briefly talk about how Pastor and I pray for money commanding the angels of God, and then we'll pick up with this again next week, just in case anybody's not here and they miss it this evening. Money is non-fatal, and a great way to practice or exercise your faith is with money. And you just have to get started, and you don't start at a million dollars. And so you might have to get started just believing God for an extra $25 a week and somebody might scoff at that in their super spirituality. But if you cannot believe God for $100 a week with your faith, why, why would you not start at $25 a week? I mean, if you cannot pray and believe God for an extra $100 to come in by Friday, you need to start at 25 To ascertain your level and where you are at in faith, then to develop your faith, grow your faith, stretch your faith, exercise your faith. So start small, grow your faith, and believe God for more. You might start with $25 a week, which would be $100 a month above and beyond. And then once you've got that under your belt, believe God for an extra $100 a week, which would be $400 a month. And then from there, go to $250 a week, which would be $1,000 a month. And somebody might say, well, Austin, I, you know, I, I make enough to pay my bills. Why do I need to believe God for an extra $1,000 a month? You selfish person, you. Have you considered the thought that maybe your wife wants a new dress? Amen. Have you considered the thought that maybe your kids want to go somewhere besides Mansfield? Right. Have you considered the thought that we're to walk in the blessing of God because there is a lost and dying and hurting world that needs the gospel proclaimed? And with every dollar that's extra, there's a tithe, but there's also, we can give a percentage that into missions, into the gospel. See, it's not just about us. Now, I learned this from my father, and so this is something that Jessica and I do personally. And then we increase the amount we believe for every single year. When we went from 2017 to 18, I, I increased the amount. When we just rolled into 2019, I, increased, I actually increased the amount we're believing for every month by 25%. And... God, as I said a few weeks ago, he'll, he, he is your source, not your job, not this or that person. He'll bless you in unusual and unexpected ways. Amen. Well, Austin, are you going to tell us what number you're believing for? No. <laughs> I don't want to cause offense. But God is moving so wonderfully. We got to the middle of January, and God had already brought in that new increased amount Amen. for January and February. So this works. Amen. See, you, you, could, you, you could work this to get everything paid off. You could work this to get student loans paid off. You could work this to get debts paid off. De Part of walking in the blessing of God is paying everybody what you owe them, regardless of what Bernie Sanders says. Amen. <laughs> so you, you can work this to be a blessing to your family, to the kingdom of God. Amen. So how can you believe God for a thousand when you can't believe God for a hundred? So you got to get started somewhere. When you have a financial need, do three things. And I would work this 
with what we're talking about Sunday, and that is the miracle of seed faith. Look to God as your source, sow seeds of faith, and expect miracles. When you have a financial need, do these three things. Number one, claim what belongs to you by faith. Claim what belongs to you by faith. Could be a, a bill you get, $250, $500, $1,000. Number one, claim what belongs to you by faith. It's yours, and our Heavenly Father wants our every need met. Claim what belongs to you by faith. And then number two, rebuke Satan. And then number three, dispatch the angels of God. See, we're to claim what we need, and we're to claim what we want. Hebrews 1 and verse 14 says, Are they not all ministering spirits, angels, sent forth to minister for them, who are the heirs of salvation? Angels don't just protect us. They work and fulfill assignments on our behalf. Now, their full-time job in your life may be keeping you out of trouble, but there's a point where we're to grow up and mature in Christ, amen? amen. So their job isn't just protecting you. You can give them assignments. You can dispatch them to bring what you need into your hands. In a restaurant, a good restaurant, the waiter ministers for you. You order what they want and they, they bring it to you. This is one of the job assignments of our angels. You order what you need or want and tell them to bring it. God doesn't have any money up in heaven. He's not a counterfeiter. What you need and what you want is down here on the earth. God created it and he put it in the earth for us. Not the devil and not for the world. The silver and the gold is the Lord's. The earth and the fullness thereof is the Lord's. The wealth of the wicked is stored up for who? Amen. And we're, we're the righteousness of God in Christ, so it's stored up for us. Amen. So what you need is here on the earth. What you need is here. So stop begging, whining, and crying about your finances. Remember, we fight the good fight of faith how? With our words, with our mouth, with what we're saying. So claim what you need. Claim what you want. One time. Why once? Because to do it more than once is contrary to faith. Go to Mark 11. We ask and we believe we receive. We ask and we believe we receive. It's so simple, we mess it up. We ask and then from the moment you ask, you don't ask again, you believe we receive. You believe you receive. Or you claim, you demand, and then from that point forward, you believe you receive. So say there's an unexpected bill for $1,000. So that's what you claim. Ministering spirits of God, I dispatch you in the name of Jesus to go forth and to bring an extra thousand dollars or to cause an extra thousand dollars to come into my hands before February 28th in Jesus' name. Then step number two, Satan, you take your hands off my money in Jesus' name. You take your hands off my blessings. You take your hands off everything I'm believing for. It is that simple. Well, what do you do the next day in prayer? Believe you receive. Thank the Lord that it's coming in. Thank your heavenly Father that it's coming in. They work on our behalf. Claim what you need. Claim what you want. Then say, Satan, take your hands off my money. Then say, angels of God, ministering spirits go and cause the money to come. Angels influence people for good, just like demons influence people for evil. And again, if I told you what Jessica and I are doing, you would think, man, they are crazy. But Every dollar we believe for in 2018 came in, plus God did exceedingly, abundantly above all that we could ask, think, or imagine. And it does, he, again, he's the source, so it comes in in unusual ways. But I don't really care what way it comes in as long as it comes in. Amen. So my, my challenge would be for you to get started. Might be $100 a week, believe in God, for an extra $100 a week, which would be $400 on average every month. Get that under your belt, then go to $250 a week, then $500 a week, then $1,000 a week. What have you got to lose? See, so many believers wait till there's a problem or there's a challenge to try and then learn how to use faith and exercise faith. No, no, no. We're to be using faith every day of our lives. And you, even if you don't need it, then you can use it to be a blessing to others. You can use it to be a blessing to your family, to the, the kingdom of God. You know, they announced youth camp. You could, be, you could believe it in just to give money so kids can go to youth camp. Amen. Good. We don't even realize the power and the authority that we have. 
Claim what you want. Claim what you need. Dispatch the ministering spirits of God. And then tell Satan to take his hands off your money. You, Sunday at 11 a.m., I shared how, for instance, right now with Sophie, because of her mouth, the size of her mouth, we found out that she needs to have orthodontic work done, dentist work done, oral surgery work done, orthodontic work done. It costs what it costs. I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to say, woe is me. I'm just going to say, God is my source. God is my supply. I'm going to find out what it costs from Jessica. Then I'm going to claim what it costs in faith. I'm going to dispatch the ministering spirits of God. And then I'm going to say, Satan, take your hands off my money. And then the money is going to march right in through the door. Amen. It works every single time. But for you to be convinced, you got to try it out. You got to get started. And you don't start at $1,000. I would say start at 100, but you might not be there. Start at 25, start wherever you feel comfortable at. Believe God, he'll confirm his word. Grow your faith, stretch your faith, exercise your faith, and then go on from there.